Hello, welcome to this week's edition of the Context Podcast. My name is Enoke Kaumba. This is where we review stories that were reported by the Namibian newspaper. During the course of the week, we give you an in-depth understanding of the stories through the reporters who covered them. In today's edition, there is no what I can call a single formula or one single factor. Rukonga Vision School Principal Moses Goregencho shares the secrets behind the public school's success in Grade 12 Ordinary Level. Mr. Lichtenstrasser pleaded not guilty to all charges. He did not give a plea explanation. The man accused of murdering two top executives of the Namibia Institute of Mining appeared in court this week and he pleaded not guilty eight times. We look at how the decision to liquidate Air Namibia was met by both the public We are shocked and disturbed and the opposition parties in parliament. Air Namibia is not yours. It's not your uncle's capital. And finally, we look at the story of Lucas Tamseb, popularly known as Arivari, the education ministry has refuted claims that he is to return to school. All right, we start off with Monday's story. We take a listen to the conversation that our northern reporter Elias Ndianale had with the principal of Rukonga Vision School. The school is located in the Kavango East region alongside the C48 roads toward the Mohembo border post. Moses Gorigencho, the principal and the former lecturer at the Zimbabwe Open University, had a conversation with Elias Ndianale and he shared the secret of the school. Let's take a listen. There are a number of things that we can just summarize to you and um, um, we think that that combination of factors together probably um, assist us. Um, I, I will start by saying that all other factors that affect education are important but to us the most critical um, factor is the human resource, mm. the teacher mm. in the class. Mm. So we try at the best level to ensure that our teachers are get fully inducted to understand our values, to understand our goals, not just to know them, but to understand them. When we say understand, it means they are convinced that this is important and we must work to achieve such goals together. A former employee of the Namibian Institute of Mining and Technology said, not guilty, my lord. Eight times are the words that came out of the accused as his double murder trial started in the Windhoek High Court. I spoke to a Werner Menges who has been following the story for more details on it. This is the trial of Ernst Lichtenstrasser. He is a former uh, lecturer or trainer at uh, the Namibian Institute of Mining and Technology at the Tumip campus. He is charged with uh, murdering the director and the deputy director of NIMT at Arandas on the 15th of April 2019. Um, that is, uh, those, the victims were Eckhard Müller, he was the uh, director, and his deputy Heimu Helwig. They were gunned down early in the morning of 15 April 2019 when they arrived for work at the NIMT campus at Arandas. Um, now, uh, this week the trial started. Um, Mr. Lichtenstrasser pleaded not guilty to all charges. He did not give a plea explanation. In other words, he did not say what the basis is of his plea. Um, you know, in other words, what is his defense to the charges. But he, um, through his lawyer, he said that he's vehemently denying that he killed the two men. So what happened this week is uh, we've, had, uh, we've heard the testimony of five witnesses so far. Over a matter of four days, we've heard the testimony of five witnesses. There are 104 witnesses, state witnesses, are listed in the state's indictment. So if all of those witnesses would have to testify, this will turn into a very long trial. Okay, and, and the witnesses that are against him, how is the evidence looking like? Okay, what we've heard so far is um, basically just the start of it all. We've heard from the witness um, who uh, found the 
the two men dead at the scene, the first witness who found them dead at the scene. She is an employee of NIMT. She, she told the court that um, she heard a loud sound, uh, went outside and she um, found them lying in a pool of blood at the entrance of the NIMT office. She did not see anybody else at the scene. Another witness who testified was the doctor who uh, carried out the post-mortem examinations on the two victims. He um, described to the court the injuries that they had, you know, various gunshot wounds to the chest and also to the head. Um, so one can imagine that uh, this was absolutely fatal. They were uh, killed um, almost immediately, if not immediately. And then there was a witness who testified, also a NIMT employee. She was the last, last witness who um, gave evidence this week. She just described that she was on her way to work. This was very early in the morning, just before seven. And she saw a white bucky leaving the NIMT campus, driven by a white man. Now, th she could not give a further description. She could not identify the person, but this was her evidence. And we will have to see how this ties in later on with the rest of the evidence that the state has. Okay, just last, maybe anything, anything maybe in the evidence that's pointing or pointing the suspect to the scene? Um, so far, no, there is nothing. But um, from what we've heard um, previously uh, with a bail hearing of Lichtenstrasse that took place in Sokop Munt in 2019, it appears that the state's case is mainly based on circumstantial evidence. So there's a lot of evidence which, when you put it together, that's, this is according to the state, when you put all of this evidence together, then it will point to his guilt. There has also been talk um, during the bail hearing that Lichtenstrasser made a confession to the police while he was questioned. He is um, saying that um, the confession was made under duress, that the police threatened him and basically forced him to confess a crime which he did not commit. Now, as, a, as the trial progresses, um, this will uh, most probably, or one can, one can almost say definitely, this will def uh, be the subject of a, a dispute between the defense and the state, where I expect the defense will be um, challenging the admissibility of evidence about this alleged confession, and um, we will have to see what the court rules, whether this can be used as evidence against him or not. I can tell you that um, the trial will be proceeding um, in April, because it was um, postponed on Thursday, uh, the first week of dates that were set aside for the trial um, came to an end and the trial is con continuing in April from the 6th of April and then there are also dates in May and at the end of June and start of July. So this is still going to be taking quite some time to finalize. Yeah, and of course you'll be snooping around just to see if there's anything that comes up in the story. We will keep you updated. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. The decision to close Air Namibia was met with outrage from the public. The National Union of Namibian Workers, alongside other several unions, staged a nationwide protest demanding that the government reverse its decision to shut down Air Namibia. We are shocked and disturbed by the degree of the deception of the will of the people of Namibia. We are saying come what will come. If there is not going to be an answer, we will just march. You will do what you need to do in terms of your law. NUW is infuriated by the inconsiderate action demonstrated by our leaders. Opposition parties as well also fumed at the decision and asked for the decision as well to be revoked. Sometimes when we take decisions that affect other people's livelihood, for God's sake, these 600 people have kids and families to take care of. Let us bring an element of humility in this discussion first and foremost. For you to move into liquidation, you must have a liquidation report of assessment, of debts, of creditors, of everything. That report was supposed to be tabled before us. The Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture has refuted claims that the rape accused Lucas Tamsa, popularly known as Arivari, 
who returned to school following his release from police custody earlier last week. The executive director of education, Sanet Stiankam, said no official request has been made for Arivari to return to school. I spoke to Alana Shikongo to give you more context on this story. So essentially, Lucas Tamsep, uh, popularly known as Irivari, was arrested at the beginning of the year um, for allegedly being involved in a gang raping of a 18-year-old girl. Um, he was recently released when the constituency councillor bailed him out. And upon bailing him out, he had said that um, the aim was to have the young man return to school uh, because education is important, of course, and he just wanted to ensure that his education continued. Um, what followed, however, was public outcry. A lot of people felt like an alleged rapist should not be put back into school to be amongst children uh, because Irivari is currently in grade one. Because his age is unknown, he doesn't have any national documents, um, he doesn't have any background, so you know, when they put him in school, they just put him in grade one. However, what the education ministry has informed us is that there has been no official um, communication or request to have Irivari put back into school, and that something like that would need to be um, very critically um, looked at before he is just placed back in school. Um, also, the Namibian um, Student Association, NANSO, um, has said that, you know, they are vehemently against him being put back into school because he poses a threat um, to other children. And the education ministry said something similar. They would really have to scrutinize the possibility of him being put back into school. Um, but it's not something that is going to happen right away, as um, the constituency councillor had alluded. All right. Well, when you spoke to Nanso, was there any indication from their side? Because from the look of things, it only looks like they just want to uh, look at uh, the interests of the other students what about him he is also a registered student who was alleged so what is did they show any sort of things that are pointing to uh, to, to the side of them protecting him as a student as well um on nanso's side no uh, i think their position right now is just to make sure that um the children in schools are safe from someone that has been accused of this act um, but from the education ministry side, though, um, the executive director, Sanet Stienkamp, had said that, um, you know, if anything, they would look at the possibility of putting him um, in some sort of, you know, um, um, training or just a different kind of program, not per se in a school. But it would, again, like I said, be something that would have to be looked at quite critically. However, the education ministry is trying to weigh both, both ends um, of the situation so that he's also not just left in the dark and neglected. All right, thank you very much. Before you go, um, what are the chances of this story developing? If it does develop, which sides can it go? Well, uh, Irivari is expected, Irivari and his three co-accused are expected um, to appear in court again on the 16th of March. And I think it will probably be around that time that we'll have new developments, um, depending on what the outco outcome of that um, court appearance is. But um, as I see it right now, you know, we don't really know what the circumstances are. So it's very hard to make any sort of judgment. And the best thing to do is to just wait until, you know, the court proceeding happens and then move from there with um, the information that is provided. And of course, I'm sure you'll be there to update us. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And that's it for this week's edition of the Context Podcast. For me, Enoch. It's a bye-bye.